Sí. The next speaker is Patricia Almirón. He is a student of Maria Alberic and Alejandro Meyer from Universidad Complutense de Madrid. He just finished his PhD and he's going to speak about Milner number versus Turina number. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to the organizing committee. It's uh, a pleasure for me to present here my, my work. And uh, so I will try to do uh, a light talk. Uh, I know it's a difficult time <laughs> after lunch. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the difference uh, between Miller and Turina number. And let's start from the beginning. Uh, the general setting is going to be, we are going to have an isolated hypersurface singularity. So we are mainly interested in two things, that is these two algebras. First one uh, is the Milner algebra, this MF, uh, with the partial derivative. And uh, we can define the Milner number, which is a topological invariant of the singularity. Uh, here a figure of uh, John Milner. And we can define also the Turina number, that is an analytic invariant of uh, the isolated hypersurface singularity. And here is Galina Turina. Uh, I encourage you to, to read the obituary of Turina. Uh, I think it's a very nice sketch of uh, her work uh, that is very interesting in singularity theory. So essentially, we are going to, to work with topological and an analytic invariant. Uh, we went to compare them. So this is a tale about topology versus analysis. So let us uh, define uh, what is uh, a topological invariant. So for us, uh, two isolated hypersurface singularities have the same topological type. If there is an homeomorphism uh, from CN to CN, such that uh, the set of zeros of F goes to the set of zeros of G. And from this definition, uh, Le and Tessier prove that if you have two isolated hypersurface singularities with the same topological type, then the Milner number is the same. So this is for us what we mean by to be a topological invariant. Uh, here I would like to remark that there's a very nice paper by Osamu Saiki uh, where uh, you can find different characterization of uh, what is uh, topological type in this sense. Uh, so I take the opportunity to say happy birthday to Professor Saiki. And the other part is going to be the analytic part. We are going to be interested. And two isolated hypersurface singularities has the same analytic type, 
uh, if there is a biolomorphic map. So observe that we are substituting the homeomorphism by a biolomorphic map. So essentially, we are doing a change of coordinate. And again, the condition is the same, the set of zero to the set of zero. And here, the main theorem is a theorem of Matter and Yao, 1982. They prove that uh, any isolated hypersurface singularity, you, we have analytically equivalent isolated hypersurface singularities, if and only if the Turina algebras are isomorphic as C algebras. So in particular, this means if we have same analytic type, then we are going to have same Turina number. The converse obviously not true because observe that from Matter and Yau theorem to be uh, analytically equivalent, we don't, it's not enough to have the same Turina number, but you must have isomorphic C Turina algebras. Something I feel uh, also it's very nice about this theorem is that if you go to the original paper of Matter and Yau, then you will find that uh, the Turina algebras are not called Turina algebras, are called moduli algebras. And this is because uh, while the Milner number was called Milner number uh, since uh, the beginning, I mean, the paper of uh, Milner, and after that, the Milner number was called like that, uh, then Turina number take a lot of time to be called Turina number in the, in the general literature. So it was not until the, the late uh, 80s, uh, where the Turina number was established as the common name for that. And the person who named Turina number to the Turina number uh, was Herr Martin Groyel in the in a paper of the beginning of the 80s. So I think it's quite a curious uh, story about that. But uh, here, all of you know this theorem. Uh, it's a key theorem in this case, is that when we have an isolated hypersurface singularity, uh, mu equal tau is equivalent to be quasi homogeneous, and it's equivalent to have exact point carry complex. This is a very important theorem of Kyoji Saito for 1971. And it was uh, a trending topic after the 70s. At uh, what extent we can uh, we can generalize this theorem to more general isolated? Yes. Can you remind me what the Poincaré complex? Yes, you have the, the the resolution with the differentials uh, of the singularities. So you have C uh, zero is the Poincaré the Ram usual complex of differentials. The, the, the Cauchul complex in the partial derivatives, or what? no, 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 is the Keller differential. Ah, okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so uh, it was somehow a general thing up to what extent we can generalize this theorem. Uh, first of all, you need to be able to define this invariant for more general singularities. So, a very natural case is the isolated complete intersection case. Uh, for isolated complete intersection singularities, we can define the Milner number and the Turina number in the natural way. Milner number is going to be the rank of this homology group of the Milner fiber because we have a well-defined Milner fiber for this case. This was a theorem of uh, Ham independently Leang Royal. Why? Because uh, Ham proved that uh, in the isolated hypersurface, uh, isolated complete intersection case. We have well-defined mineral uh, fiber, and the mineral fiber is, is a wedge of a sphere in, this, in the same case as uh, for isolated hypersurface singularity. From the other point of view, Le and Royal proof some more algebraic formula to define this number, analogously to the hypersurface case. On the other hand, Turin's number is defined in the natural way, so it's the same for isolated hypersurface and isolated complete intersection. And with this definition, it's natural to ask is it possible to generalize Kyoji Saito theorem in this uh, full generality? So there is uh, a paper of Pfister and Schumann of 1989, and they found an example of an isolated complete intersection singularity that is not quasi homogeneous, but the Poincare complex is exact. So we must forget about Poincare complex, exactness of the Poincare complex, in order to characterize equality between Milner and Turin and so the only hope is that the equality between Milner and Turina number is going to be a good measure of quasi homogeneity. And this was a theorem, one part is from Royal, 1980, and the other part is from Bosega, 2002. Observe how many times I spent a lot of people trying to prove the, that uh, this is equivalent. So this is a very difficult problem, very interesting one, that uh, we can generalize this part of Kyoji Saito theorem for isolated complete intersection singularity. So essentially, comparing Milner and Turina number, which are uh, from one side topological 
uh, from the other side analytic, we are comparing how far our singularity is to be quasi-homogeneous or not. Uh, another important theorem is uh, we want to measure the difference. And then if we have a um, theorem of Loyenga and Stimbling of 1985, they prove that uh, if we have an isolated complete intersection singularity of dimension uh, bigger or equal than two, then we can express the difference of the Miller and Tyria number in terms of some analytic invariants. So these are Hodge numbers, and the other one are analytic invariant of the singularity. I'm not going to, to give detail about that, but just observe that you have a formula for the difference. This formula is for 1985, but uh, <laughs> the main theorem is quite uh, more difficult. So observe that uh, Groyer and Bosch theorem is quite a hard theorem. But in general, the main thing is that uh, while for isolated hypersurface singularities, is the inequality mu bigger or equal than tau is trivial by definition. Uh, there is it's not so trivial to prove that in the isolated complete intersection case, this inequality holds. And this inequality holds because this theorem. So now we are in a good situation. We, work, we want to compare Milner and Turin a number. Uh, we know that Milner is weaker or equal than tau. We have a lot of theory about that. And the question is, nobody in this time has think about what happened with upper bounds. Because uh, all the people during, during the 80s were working very hard, very, very hard, in order to prove this inequality. But uh, what happened with upper bounds? So a first uh, approach to this problem was uh, in a paper of uh, Yong Xian Liu in 2017. He proved that uh, you have an isolated hypersurface singularity. Then the quotient between the Miller and Turin number, which by Kyoji Saito's theorem is always bigger or equal than one, also is upper bounded by the number of variables by n. And the question is, uh, is this the best bound or not? And uh, first, let me introduce another invariant of the singularity. That is the singularity spectrum, or the exponent. So this definition is quite complicated. Please uh, forget about that, but just to know that uh, there is a set of invariants defined like this. We have mu, where mu is the Miller number, rational numbers. These rational numbers lies on this interval, 0, n plus 1. n plus 1 is the number of variables, sorry. Uh, this is uh, cn plus 1. So here, n plus 1. All the time is uh, happening to me the same. And they are certain logarithm of eigenvalues of the monodromy on the Milner, uh, the middle cohomology of the Milner fiber. Very difficult definition. But as you know, uh, for the monodromy, we have that all eigenvalues are root of unity. So in particular, the logarithms should be rational number. And the difficult part is to define why they lie on, on this interval, because we are taking complex logarithms. So we sh should choose a branch of the complex logarithm. But this is something that I'm not going to explain, because uh, what I want is uh, to show you that uh, there is a theorem of Parchenko in 1981. And he proved that uh, if you look at the difference between the maximal and the minimal spectral value, then f to the power of this uh, floor function of uh, this number plus one belongs to the Jacobian idea. And why this theorem is interesting? If you go to the proof of Liu's theorem, he's using Briamson Skoda theorem. But, uh, I assume that all of you know Briamson Skoda, but you can really improve uh, Liu's theorem. How can you improve this? It's very easy because uh, it's the same. The sketch of the proof is the same. Why? Because uh, what we have is that you are going to have Milner algebra, and then you can look at the Turin algebra as the co-kernel of the multiplication by f in the Milner algebra. So since uh, Turin algebra is the co-kernel of multiplication by f in the Milner algebra, then the dimension of the kernel is also tau. So you can construct somehow a filtration uh, and to obtain a lone star sequence here. And instead of applying Briamson's Skoda theorem, we are going to apply in Bancherko's theorem. If you apply Varchenko's theorem, then you are going to have, for sure, a better upper bound. And a better upper bound, this is just because since you have here a rational number, for example, then you are going to take a floor function, then you usually have something that is l better than n plus 1. And for example, if you have rational singularities, the case of rational singularities is very interesting because you are going to have a much better upper bound. So from this point of view, again, the same question. 
is this the best bar or not? And here we are going to, to tip on the on our main things, no? Generally, it's not going to be the best. And why? So our motivation when, when I started my PhD thesis, uh, so our motivation was a paper of Think Android 2018. And uh, they saw these uh, families of uh, plane curve singularities, and they compute the Milner and the Turina number for both families. And then they proved that uh, the question with, uh, I mean, you are parameterizing this uh, by A, then the question of Milner and Tau, which only depend on A and B, uh, tends to 4 over 3, when these numbers tend to infinity. And in that paper, just with these two examples, uh, they ask, is for any plane curve singularity mu over tau less than 4 over 3? So this was our starting point of the PCCCs. And uh, our first result was uh, to, to take an irreducible plane curve singularity. And then we found that uh, if you consider a family of plane curve singularities with the same topological type, then you can compute the minimal Turina number in this family in terms of the resolution invariance. So, for example, the sequence of multiplicity of the three star form along a resolution. The formula is explicit, but uh, since uh, I'm not going to use it yet, I don't want to, to put the formula. It's too complicated and no, no, it said no, no like to the problem. And this result we obtained it at uh, the beginning was also obtained it at the same time by Johan Gensmer and Marcelo Hernandez. Uh, as a consequence of this formula, for irreducible plane curve singularities, we are able to compute the Milner number in terms of the resolution. And from the other part, since by our theorem, we are able to compute the minimal Turing number from the resolution. So doing the computation, we obtain the bound, and we prove this particular case. Uh, something very funny about that is that uh, I was, uh, you know, I was doing the, my PhD, and uh, we obtained the result. And then we put it on the archive, and two days, uh, two, three days before, then uh, Marcelo and, uh, and Gesmer paper appeared in the archive, proving the same result. It was very funny. But then, uh, two weeks uh, before that, then uh, another paper of uh, one appeared also on the archive, proving the same result. So it was very funny that uh, I was working in a problem that uh, three different groups of mathematicians, uh, we didn't communicate each other, and we were working in the, in the same problem. But uh, of course, uh, as you can see, we are with irreducible plane curve singularities. So the natural question is what happened for non-irreducible plane curve singularities? Uh, this is uh, now a very difficult problem. Why? Because our techniques to prove this main theorem that allow us to prove this uh, relies on things that really depend on the irreducibility of the curve. I mean, we need uh, two main theorems, one of Tessier and the other one of Kensman, that allow us to compute that. But uh, this theorem, there is no, at least at this moment, it's really difficult to try to find for a generalization of this. From the other point of view, uh, the formula for the minimal Turina number is really complicated. Uh, so imagine that uh, you start to work with uh, trying to find a formula for a minimal Turina number for non irreducible plane curve singularities. And uh, you arrive that uh, you have the formula, you have the formula for minimal number, and then you are not able to compute this thing. It can happen. So in general, it could be difficult. And also, uh, as I have shown you, uh, Dink and Royal proposed this only with two examples. And uh, the question is why 4 over 3? And here I want to be a, want to tell you something. No? So uh, you have uh, this nice book of Edwin Abbott, Flatland. And in a part of the book, uh, the, the, the little hexagon that is, uh, if you have read the book, it's very nice because uh, you have a, a family and the family are a figure in the plane. And then the main thing that uh, is in the text is that uh, there is no meaning to three to the third in geometry of two dimension. Because three to the third in geometry of two dimension, you can define it algebraically, but there is no geometric meaning there because you don't have dimension there enough. But if you move to the, to the three-dimensional space, then three to the third is a volume form. So sometimes when you want to, to understand arithmetic things uh, from a geometric point of view, sometimes you need more dimensions. And that's exactly what we are going to do. We are going to move to more general hypersurface singularities. 
And for more general hypersurface singularities, we can define another important invariant. Uh, so let us put us in this uh, setting. So we consider an isolated hypersurface singularity and a resolution of singularity. An holomorphic form is called of the first kind if uh, you can extend the form to the whole resolution. Defining holomorphic forms of first kind, we can define a very important invariant that is the geometric genus. And the geometric genus can be defined as the complex dimension of this quash. But uh, most important is that we have a theorem of Morihiko Saito in 1983. That is that the geometric genus is the number of spectral values less or equal than one. And with this set, the question is, can we relate the geometric genus with the Milner and the Turin number? And this is uh, our new perspective from Dean Kang Roger question. So we go to a theorem of Jonathan Wall in 1985. And for isolated hypersurface singularities, we have this nice relation between the Milner, the Turina, and the geometric genus. It's uh, Milner minus Turina is less or equal than twice the geometric genus. From the other point of view, now we have a nice relation, but uh, how can we relate the Milner and Turina number uh, of an isolated plane curve singularity with an isolated surface singularity? So it's this kind of uh, singularities we need to consider. We consider the equation of the plane curve, we add a set square, and then we have same Milner and Turin number. And we are very lucky because we have a result of Tomari in 1981, and he proved that eight times the geometric genus is strictly less because eight times plus one is less or equal than the Milner number. And now with this, our problem is solved in a very easy way because we take a gen of plane curve singularity, we put our surface, nice surface, and we apply both theorems. And then we have, first, we have a geometric interpretation of why this bound should be like this. We have also a geometric interpretation of why we have the strict inequality, because the strict inequality is coming from Tomari's theorem, that the geometric genus is strictly less than the minimum number. And asymptotically, we have this bound. So from this point of view, we not only solve the and royal question, but we also give a geometric interpretation of why this question should be true. And we have been used the theory of surface singularity. So it is natural to us, it's going to be general for any surface singularity. The answer is no. You can find this example, computer numbers with a computer, and then you have that this is bigger than 4 over three. So natural question is, what is the one for surface singularities? And here enters into the game Darcy conjecture. Darcy conjecture is a very important conjecture in singularity theorem, which is still open today, and ask if for any isolated surface singularity, six times the geometric genus is less or equal than the mean number. A lot of cases have been done in, uh, in this uh, conjecture, but it is still open. And as you know, if we can, we can combine now Darcy conjecture with Jonathan Ward theorem. And what we obtain is that for any isolated surface singularity satisfying Darcy conjecture, we are going to have that mu over tau is less than three half. So the question is, is this sharp or not? And the answer is yes. We can find an isolated surface singularity, compute the minimal Turing number in this family, and then we can check that this question tends to three half. So it is very natural then to propose the following conjecture. So is for any isolated surface singularity this mu over tau less than three half? Moreover, this conjecture is interesting because uh, observe that Darcy conjecture implies our conjecture. So obviously, if you want to find contraexample, for example, uh, to Darcy conjecture, then maybe it is easier to try to compute in families mu and tau. For sure, it's easier to compute Milner and Turing number than to, to compute the geometric genus. So this is a good tool to, to, to check if uh, the remaining cases of Darcy conjecture uh, holds or not. And with this general setting, why not to, to propose the problem behind this? Because I have told you that uh, we started with plane curve singularity, we have moved to isolated surface singularity, but we can define Milner and Turing number for any isolated complete intersection singularity. During the 80s, as I told you, the, the main problem was to, to check what is happening with uh, mu and tau. Is this bigger or equal than, than zero? this difference is bigger or equal than zero. But now, 
uh, after all these results, we realized that uh, there is also a very interesting problem to try to find upper bounds for this different in this way. I mean, we want to upper bound this thing by a rational number times the minor number. This is what we are doing. And this uh, question is also related to the geometric properties of the geometric genus, uh, the relation with the geometric genus and the minor number. So essentially what we are asking for is uh, up to what extent the topology of a singularity constrains the analytic properties of our singularity. That is uh, the main question behind this problem. And also, and not only that, is that um, we want something optimal. I mean, we want to find families where somehow we can go up to, to, to the direct inequality in some good way. I think this uh, problem in general is a, is a very nice problem because of this reason, because in general, you may think, okay, uh, why I should be worried about that? Uh, but uh, then when you go down to the, what is happening behind, because you can see the problem, the, oh, okay, it's easy because Milner Tower defined it in, a, in an algebraic way, so why I shouldn't be able to do that? And it's because algebraically, we are seeing that uh, when we look to the algebraic properties, for example, Liu's theorem or the, the theorem I proof Ushin Bar Barchenko's theorem, this is purely algebraic. And from the purely algebraic things, you are not able to, to give good upper bounds. And you are able to improve this upper bound by using geometry. So behind this is uh, to try to understand from the geometric point of view what is happening with the analytic structure of our singularity. Of this problem, I will uh, sketch this. So in the case of Planckert singularities, we have think and gray, which uh, I proved that. In the case of curved singularities in any dimension, plus an extra condition that is to be, uh, it's very technical condition, but we can prove something similar by using our result. And of course, in the surface case, we can use Starfy conjecture to prove this one. So at this stage, uh, I finished uh, the, the work in, of my PhD. And, uh, and now, quite recently, I was uh, thinking about this problem. Uh, thinking about this problem, recall, uh, how did I solve uh, Dicker-Groyer conjecture. So I use a family where I take a plain curve singularity and I add a new variable, a separated variable. So natural question, uh, this family of singularities. What happened in the Tom Sebastiani case? So Tom Sebastiani case is that we are going to have F1 and F2 here of isolated hypersurface singularities in separated variables and we are going to add things. As all of you know, there's many important things in this setting. The first one is that the Milner number is, uh, has a very nice expression. It's a product of the Milner numbers. Why we call Tom Sebastiani to this uh, family of singularities? So mainly because of the theorem of Sebastiani and Tom of uh, 1971. They proved that the monodromy of the sum is the tensor product of the local monodromy. So essentially, uh, after the Sebastiani and Tom theorem, uh, which is a very nice uh, topological thing in the separated case. Uh, a lot of people was asking what happened to the analytic invariance in this case. This is a very difficult thing. But uh, in the analytic case, we can also find several properties. First one, Saito and Marchenko proved that the spectral numbers has this nice expression. So the spectral number of the sum can be split in the sum of spectral numbers of, different, of the different things. So if we can compute from the spectral number of F and the spectral number of G, or F2, uh, the spectral number of the sum. A lot of people work in this uh, topic, and we have a lot of results in this direction. For instance, we have variation operation, uh, zeta function, miss Hodge structure, multiple ideas, Hodge ideal, and all, et cetera. So I told you at the beginning of the talk that the Turina number is a very important analytic invariant. And we have this bunch of uh, analytic invariant where we know what is happening in the Tom Sebastiani case. I was very surprised of uh, what about the number. So I started a research in the literature if somebody has worked about the Turina number in the Tom Sebastiani case. 
because it's natural to, to think about it. I mean, you have this natural, this very nice expression of the Milner number. You have somehow a very nice expression of the spectral numbers. You have more or less a nice expression of the mixed host structure. And uh, why uh, I don't have anything about the Turing number? So looking a lot of things, I realized that nobody has tackled this problem. For me, it was uh, amazing because uh, that, as uh, I have told you, Turing number is, uh, for me, a, a, a very important invariant. And then I was able to produce the following uh, result of uh, Don Sebastiani result uh, of the Turing number. And here, please don't be scared about the formula. The formula is <laughs> very <laughs> difficult formula. Maybe this is the reason why nobody has uh, um, done anything about that, because the formula, as you can see, is quite uh, difficult to write. Also, there is uh, two bad points. The first point is that uh, observe that uh, these are numbers. So this is the Turing number of F1, Turing number of F2. Miller number of F1, Turing number of F1. But this number also only depends on F2. This number only depends on F1. But these two correction terms seems that uh, they really depend on the, on the sum. So this is uh, not a good thing for, for a result of the Tom Sebastiani type. Because we would like to be able to compute the invariant just from the invariance of the separated things. And it seems that uh, this is going to be difficult in the Turing's case. However, and I'm very happy about this thing, is that we have this sequence of inequalities. We have that the Turing number of the sum is, is bigger or equal than the product of the Turing number. But better is that we have also an upper bound. That is the, the product of the tau plus the product of the difference of the mu and tau. Um, moreover, and something that is very good, is that this upper bound are sharp. We can find, for example, the easiest one to, to check that this is sharp. Take a quasi homogeneous, uh, this is a stupid thing because obviously we know that in the quasi homogeneous thing, we have uh, equality of Milner and Turing number and this is the product. But observe that uh, from this inequality, we can also check that because we have that if you have something quasi homogeneous and you apply Saito, then the Turing number is going to be the product. But uh, not only that, for example, take the Don Sebastiani thing of something that is not quasi homogeneous and another thing that is quasi homogeneous. And then again, you have the product. So this is very nice. And on the other part, you have why this second inequality is sharp. This is more tricky, but essentially, uh, very nice example is take two plane curve singularities and do the join of two plane curve singularities. If you do the join of these two plane curve singularities, then you can check, this is, you should be checked, that uh, this inequality becomes an equality. I mean, the, the upper bound inequality, inequality is sharp with this example. This is for other reasons that I don't want to explain, but an example of uh, sharpness for the upper bound is the join of two plane curve singularities. And let me show you a little bit a sketch of the proof because I think it is interesting. The, the main thing is that, uh, as I told you, the, I can see the Turina number at the co-kernel of the multiplication map. And uh, I have that the Milner algebra uh, can be decomposed uh, as the tensor product of the Milner algebra. So then I can try to, to describe what is happening with this map in an algebraical way. This is uh, very difficult because uh, of the following thing. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, the notation. So what we are going to use is a trick. We are going to consider the composition of the Milner algebra as follows. We first take, take the kernel of, uh, of the multiplication map on each uh, fi, okay? And, uh, and then vi, essentially, is the image when we delete the, the intersection between the kernel and the, and the, and the image. Because uh, the problem is that uh, the sum of the kernel and image here is not a direct sum. So essentially, we want to describe as a direct sum this uh, sum, this uh, space. Recall that we are always working with C vector spaces. So essentially, this is fancy linear algebra. And then we have this direct sum decomposition of this space. 
And now this is the remaining part in the minor algebra. So now this is going to be somehow the sum, and then is what uh, we have left in the intersection of these two spaces. And the main thing, and the main difficult part to prove is that by using this decomposition, we are going to be able to describe the image of the multiplication map. And what is really, really, really difficult is to prove that uh, this thing is uh, a direct sum. This is why I put it in, in blue. So you can prove that you have a sum. Somehow you can prove easily, more or less, using this decomposition that you have a sum. Why? Because this, you have this linear map. This is a linear map between the vector spaces. And kernel goes out. Here you have image. Here you have something that you know that is non-zero. So more or less, it's not uh, difficult to prove that you are going to have a sum. And the difficult part is to prove that this is a direct sum. And to prove that this is a direct sum, we are going to use, it's very important to have these spaces I call A1, uh, A2. Because these spaces, the things is that uh, the, they don't have pre-image. So they are some, something in the minor algebra that goes to the image, uh, but uh, they are not in the, in, the, in the sum of this. So it, this is important. And this is quite a complicated thing. But uh, once you have that this is a direct sum, then what you need to do is to compute the dimension of each space. And essentially, this is what we do. So, so we compute, we call uh, this number I put in the definition is going to be the intersection between the kernel and the image. This other number is the dimension of this guy. And this other number is this intersection very early. Okay? I don't like that term. Uh, I must admit that at the beginning, I was thinking that uh, these things were appearing in the, in the formula. Uh, but uh, after explaining the, the proof to Juan Viu, <laughs> we, he, he told me to justify something. And then I found that, uh, again, you need to check everything. And then these two terms uh, appear. Uh, and this is quite hard to, to prove. But again, it's fancy linear algebra. You are doing tensor product with seven vector spaces in this interpretation, and then you need to work a lot to, to check all the properties. But uh, now we have uh, this formula that is nice. And uh, I would like to, to, to check the, the inequalities. Uh, the inequalities are more easy to, to check. The, the formula is uh, nice. And then we have that the, this number can be bounded by this thing. This is easy to see, just because uh, of that this is uh, the intersection of uh, uh, this is the dimension of this thing. So it's uh, easy to prove that uh, this, you have this inequality. And from this inequality, you can prove the lower bound. Lower bound is uh, more or less easy. And the upper bound is a little bit tricky, but essentially, again, you are doing intersections, and, and then you can prove this thing. And then you arrive to some inequality like this. And in this inequality, the main thing is that uh, this V1 Fi is always less or equal than this different. So this term is negative, and this term is negative, and we have inequality here. So now this is more or less the idea of the proof. I, uh, I mean, I cannot explain in, in five minutes the proof, because essentially it's to do the details. And you need uh, more than one and a half page to do the details by hand. Uh, so I can show you the sketch, but uh, you need, really need to go to the proof to, to to, show, to see why this is a direct sum and, and everything. But uh, now I want to show you in this uh, last 10 minutes I have, I want to show you some consequences. The first one is something that I'm very interested. Uh, quite recently, uh, this uh, uh, group of mathematicians uh, defined something that is called Turina subspectrum. Uh, as I told you, I have defined the spectrum before. Um, but the Turina subspectrum is a subset of the spectrum of your singularity, uh, such that the, the number of uh, things you, you take here is the Turina number. The correct definition is very technical because you need to, to work with uh, several things. Uh, essentially, you need to, uh, to work with uh, Hodge ideals, uh, B filtration. But the important thing is this is a subset of the spectrum of the singularity. And uh, recall that, uh, as I told you, uh, the spectrum of the singularity has very nice properties with respect to the Tom Sebastiani case. Because the spectrum of a singularity 
can be in the tone Sebastianic case, can be expressed as the sum of the spectral number. So, natural question is, uh, is the theory in a subspectrum uh, satisfying a condition like this? And this is a corollary of our formula is that uh, you cannot expect this. Because if you have uh, Don Sebastiani formula, I mean, if you have something like this for the Turina subspectrum, then the Turina number should be the product of the Turina number. But uh, as I have told you, uh, most of the time you don't have that the Turina number is the product of two Turina numbers. It's the product of the Turina number plus something. So the Turina subspectrum in this case is telling you something more. And uh, I think it would be very nice to try to understand what is happening here because for me it's very strange. Because essentially these two numbers are coming from somewhere and they are the sum or something, but uh, they are not coming from the same uh, Turina subspectrum. Uh, however, I think uh, going into the proof, what I think is that uh, you are going to have uh, something like this. I'm not sure about that, that why I put it like a question, but uh, the feeling is that pr most probably what is happening is that uh, you are only going to have equality if and only if this theory in a subspectrum is going to be like this. Obviously, there is an obvious direction. I mean, if you know that the theory in a subspectrum is like that, then you are going to have this. But the other way around, I, I think it would be nice if uh, it is true or not. I, I, I'm, not quite sure, but uh, it will be very nice. And I think that uh, this uh, problem is, for me, intriguing because of uh, what I said, that uh, the Turina spectrum is not satisfying what uh, satisfies the usual spectrum. Another thing that is uh, interesting, uh, quasi homogeneous singularities uh, uh, coming, uh, arising as the join of singularities. Obviously, from our formula, it is very easy to prove uh, that the following are equivalent, that uh, the join is uh, quasi-homogeneous if and only if each function is quasi-homogeneous and if and only if the Turing number is uh, the product of the Milner number, I mean, equal to the, to the Milner number. Essentially, most of the equivalences are by Kyoji Saito's theorem, but also you can recover everything for the, from the formulas. And, uh, for example, uh, it's uh, nice to see that uh, you can only have something quasi homogeneous if you, you can only have a join that is quasi homogeneous if you add two quasi homogeneous things. And just from the formulas. I mean. Another thing is that uh, you can also characterize uh, the cases of the Tom Sebastiani where the Milner and Turina are not uh, very far. I mean, for example, where the difference between the Milner and Tau is one and the difference between Milner and Tau is two. And then you have this classification and this, uh, okay, this is a classification. But uh, nice thing, as you can observe, uh, when you want in a Ton Sebastiani case a small uh, difference between Milner and Tau, then you need to add something that is more or less a, an easy singularity. Because uh, as you have seen, Milner and Tau should be quasi homogeneous uh, of one of them and uh, the, they should be very small in order to have this. Uh, I think this is interesting because uh, you have this decomposition and then you can classify like this and then you know that uh, the joints of uh, things that are with uh, Milner and Tau very near one each other uh, should be like this. And finally, uh, the main reason, no? I have told you that I was looking for upper bounds. So since uh, I was looking for upper bound, we have uh, natural corollaries of our formula. So for example, we can prove that uh, if we take a quasi homogeneous function in any number of variables, and then we have a plain curve singularity, then the question is less than four over three always, the, the question of the joint. And this is just because uh, what you are going to have is by our formula, Milner, uh, the Turing number is the product of the Turing numbers. And uh, one of them is the Milner one. And the Milner number is the product of the Milner number. So, Milner of G and Milner of G cancel out, and then I have four over three. For me, I'll say that uh, in general, if you look at uh, Liu's theorem, uh, for example, no, uh, you you have that uh, the question between Milner and Turing number is less than the number of variables. Here, you may have an infinite, as uh, as uh, great as uh, you want, number of variables, uh, but the question is always going to be less than four over three. This is quite amazing because you, you expect something as, uh, as big as you want, but uh, you can constrain uh, to 4 over 3. On the other hand, also, you can 
also proof that uh, is also uh, an easy corollary. At, uh, if you have a surface singularity satisfying Darcy conjecture, then a same, again, we, we, we play the same trick. And, uh, and also the other one, it is also trivial, no? I mean, you take F and G and then you do the, the, the join, and then this is less than two. One point, I say to you that I want sharp upper bound, sharp asymptotically sharp, asymptotically sharp. The main thing is that when I, when I was uh, using quasi homogeneous function, then it is easy to show that the same sample that give me sharpness in these cases, give me also sharpness uh, when I add quasi homogeneous things. This is uh, easy to see. So I can show you that uh, there is uh, asymptotically sharp families where uh, these bounds are achieved. However, and this is uh, the more difficult thing, I was not able to prove that this is an asymptotically sharp uh, bound. And uh, let me explain you the reason. The reason is uh, easy. Is that because you are going to have a surface singularity and a plane curve singularity. When you try to, to do join, then the problem is that uh, you have more deep in the Jacobian ideal. I mean, you are doing multiplication by F, you are doing multiplication by G, and when you have uh, more and more and more and more number of variables, and then you try to do the repeated join, then this is the, in our formula, observe that I have a defect. So I have the product of the Turing number plus the product of uh, the difference that is measuring the non quasi homogeneity. So if I, if I take two things that are non quasi homogeneous, then these uh, terms is going to appear. And it's going to appear again and again and again and again. And it's uh, difficult that, uh, to, to show that uh, you are going to have sharpness there. In any case, uh, from, from our formula, uh, I have uh, an upper bound and a lower bound. But, uh, the lower bound, again, is uh, difficult to control. But in any case, uh, this uh, formula for the Don Sebastiani case uh, allow you to, to, to compute a bunch of uh, huge number of examples. And not only that, but uh, also to allow you to compute the Turing number in this uh, new setting that uh, for me is quite surprising. So just as a concluding remark, no? so uh, in general, I would like to convince you to, to work in this problem, no? because I think that uh, this problem is, uh, is quite a, a nice problem about understanding what is happening between geometry and uh, topology and the analytic uh, properties of an isolated surface singularity, an isolated hypersurface, uh, isolated complete intersection. It would be very nice to find uh, not uh, more bound, but as, uh, as usual, and uh, just uh, also as, um, as, I, as I told you, for example, with the flatland example, no? So uh, we like to do things. Um, we like algebraically, to work algebraically is very good because most of the time you can compute things and it's very nice to compute things. But computing to, uh, without understanding the geometric meaning of the things is something that uh, for me is like, I mean, you are missing something. And, uh, it would be very nice to really go deep in, into this problem from the geometry because, uh, as I told you, in the isolated complete intersection case, we have a very nice formula of Lojeng and Steinbrink related with the mixed Hodge structure, and we have a lot of geometry behind. And as uh, I told you here, the, when you use geometry, you improve very nice the, the bounds. So most probably what you are doing is that geometry is behind all this story, and then I encourage you to, to work on that. And um, thank you very much for the attention and muito obrigado pela sua atenção. Hi, nice. I would like to ask you the following. So you have that multiplication by F. Yeah. Um, gives you almost everything, yeah, but not the, 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 the sharp, the sharpness. Hmm. So what happens when you take, when you go to infinity, for example, you, you take asymptotically, what happens with the spectrum there? I mean, can you explain this, the upper bounds, the, the sharpness with respect to some uh, parts of the spectrum of the singularity? Yes, I can, I can explain what is happening. Uh, but it has to do with the spectrum, yeah. I guess, yeah. Essentially, essentially in, the, 
in the infinity, something very nice uh, happen. I mean, there is a, uh, what they have not tried is to do it, uh, to do the limit in this uh, direction, but I think it works. Uh, in the infinity, for example, take a plane curve singularity and uh, irreducible plane curve singularity. And then uh, there is a paper of uh, Kyoji Saito studying the limit distribution of spectral values. And this limit distribution of spectral values tend to something very nice. When you do the limit, then the, the distribution of spectral values, what you have is a, a set, a finite set of rational numbers. This is the spectrum. When you do the limit, when the minimum numbers tend to infinity, essentially you have you are going to have a continuous distribution. And the nice thing is that the the, the distribution of spectral values in the limit is something quasi homogeneous. This is surprising. I mean, it's, it tends to the distribution of the quasi homogeneous thing. We recently proved with Matthias Schulz, we proved that uh, this also holds for Newton non degenerate singularity. Uh, it, it's very nice because you have the spectrum, and then in the limit, the spectrum tends to the distribution of, some, of the quasi homogeneous model, uh, which is a crazy stuff. But, uh, but uh, and the, the thing is, uh, then the, the bound is surprising because. Uh, uh, since I'm telling you that the spectrum somehow tends to a distribution of uh, of the quasi homogeneous, you should think that uh, when you do this kind of limit asymptotically, then your singularity is approaching to something quasi homogeneous. But no, the thing is that uh, the, the, in the limit you are approaching something quasi homogeneous. No, it's because uh, the number of spectral values tends to infinity, and then you have something rational, that, and then you fool the whole space in a continuous way. But this continuous way is uh, the one that you could expect from the weight. But uh, it's this kind of things. So, but it should be nice to understand everything in the whole, uh, everything together, because uh, these all results are separated. So it's, uh, I think it's a good uh, comment. Yeah. And one, 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 more, one more thing. I mean, if you take all this uh, sort of exact sequence, that, not, not sort, this exact sequence with, um, with the tensor products. Yeah. And, okay, we, know we, we cannot project, yeah, we cannot project those tensor products, but if you have some, some operator on this, on this guy, for example, some linear um, form on each mm. of these uh, algebras, then you can project. Yeah. So somehow you could get, but I, we don't know if we, we know we have bilinear form. We don't know if we have something linear though. Yeah. But if there existed something linear there, you could project. So from the whole spectral, you could from the uh, tensor, you could go down hmm. and compare these 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 two things. I mean, you know, just going down there. Probably, yes. I mean, this because it is very difficult. This it is huge. I mean, this formula. Yeah. With a. Yes, that I mean, would be not nice. nice. It is not nice formula. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's. Uh... I mean, that that's, uh, could be nice to find something like that. But it's really, for example, I, I try first to prove this uh, Don Sebastian thing by using the the Mishkoch structure or something like that. But it's really difficult because the filtration is uh, crazy. And as I look at the, the papers uh, in the mix, uh, the Bruce Robert numbers and this, uh, and try to, to see is, uh, if I can find the Don Sebastian there. But again, Projection there is difficult. So yeah. at the end, the proof is fancy linear algebra. <laughs> it's, it's easier to, to to do the computation. But uh, now that uh, I have the computation, it would be nice to recover things because now you know what uh, should be there. Yeah. And the problem is to know what uh, are you going to have. <laughs> when you know what are you going to have, then to look for interpretation, I think, is should be more this easy now, but yeah. <laughs> more um, easy to handle at, uh, a little bit. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, I have uh, two questions. So, first of all, do you know if the Turina subspectrum is containing in some way the fact that you have, if you have something quasi homogeneous? Because if you, if one of the two things when you the the Tom Sebastiani singularities is quasi homogeneous, then you have the quality of the of the product. But yeah. In your problem, maybe that happens in the case you have something quasi homogeneous yeah. in one of the cases, and this. Yeah, I think uh, what I think is that um, in the quasi homogeneous case, it's uh, easy because uh, uh, you have, uh, I mean, you are going to have your function in the, in the Jacobian, and then the, the spectrum is uh, easy to describe, and then it's uh, not very difficult to, to check that. Uh, 
uh, I think that the, Turina, the nice thing about the Turina to, to spectrum is when you take something that is not quasi homogeneous, because then it is going to give you some information that is relevant. Uh, you, you cannot deduce exactly, I mean, uh, in, this, in that paper that is quite complicated, very difficult to understand for me, but uh, the, the general idea is that um, the, you need to, to use Hodge ideals and, and all that stuff. So when you are, the, the, the nice thing is when you are not working in the question machine case. Because in that case, then you need to go to the Hodge ideal and the V filtration in the Hodge ideal and then to work with everything. And then they give, uh, they put a lot of effort to, to check that uh, from this uh, B filtration in the Hodge ideal, then you can go to the B filtration that is giving you the spectrum. Uh, this is quite a hard paper to read, but uh, I think that the, the nice information is there, but I need to understand <laughs> to understand it a little bit. Thank you. And the, the other thing is, do you know something about uh, the formations, families? How is the, the question behaved or something? I don't know because uh, I mean the, the paper is quite uh, quite the paper of uh, these people is uh, recent and I discovered it uh, half a year ago or something like that and uh, I don't know I, I think it is starting this uh, kind of things. Mm, you gave uh, geometrical interpretation for the four over three, but maybe I missed it. But uh, do you have a geometrical interpretation for the three over two? Yes, because uh, it's uh, again it's uh, Darfi conjecture. I mean, in both cases, it's Darfi conjecture. And the, the question is that in the four over three case, uh, it is very special because in the surface case, the only case where where you have you, where you can improve. I mean, some cases you can improve the six. Uh, let me. Yeah, in some cases you can improve this six, but not very much. So the only case, the only case in surface singularities where you can put something representative more small is this case, and in this case you have the eight. So essentially, in both cases, the the geometric reason that uh, this bound is going to be three half is Darfi conjecture, which uh, Darfi conjecture again in this uh, paper uh, of QG Saito can be interpreted as uh, the comparison between the discrete distribution of spectral values and the continuous expected distribution of spectral values. Uh, so essentially, the geometric interpretation you may have here is again that uh, in the, is, uh, the distribution of spectral values, that you have mu and tau, you have a relation uh, mu and tau with the number of spectral values less or equal than one, and then you have a comparison of the, how many spectral values do you have there with respect to what you expect in the limit continuous case. But then yeah. this uh, this geometric interpretation doesn't help for higher dimensions because you're uh, using up to now no yeah we are, we are trying to to working on that okay. <laughs> uh, but yes yes uh, yeah. uh, but I expect that this is uh, the reason is going to be similar okay. thank you thank you yeah one last question maybe uh, did you think or do you think you also have a chance with some of your methods to go beyond complete intersections? For instance, tackling Wall's conjecture on non gorenstein surface singularities in C4? So if you can find this uh, kind of things for uh, in singularities where you can, where you have the inequality, no? for example, Gorenstein, uh, no, I, no, I don't know if you have heard of yeah. this conjecture. Uh, but, but then uh, what uh, did you... It's, it's also a mu versus tau result, yeah. but with an offset. I think uh, plus or minus one. But uh, yeah. if, if you haven't heard about this before, then maybe no. it's... I, I read a, a little bit of things uh, out of the isolated complete intersection case, but just a little bit. And I know that uh, it's natural to propose a problem, but I don't know where I can find... I mean, I, I would like to understand the geometry in that case. And outside this uh, world of isolated complete intersection, things, for me at least, becomes a little bit uh, more difficult to understand. It's for me difficult to understand this part. So yes, that's why yes. I didn't <laughs> take the opportunity to... to okay, then on. maybe we get to talk about this uh, over coffee break or yeah. something. Okay, great. Nice, yeah. thanks. 
Well, Matias said that this was the last question, but I'm going to, since I'm the chairman, I'm going to make a question. <laughs> why, why these numbers are rational? The, the spectral? No, the, 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 the bounds. Ah, the bounds. Or why they should be rational? No, I think I, I mean I put I didn't put a reduce uh, thing. I mean, I mean you you may have a two or no or the rational in what sense? At some point you said problem something. Yeah. There is a and b yeah. so, such that something. Yeah. And then it's the fraction a over b. Yeah. Why is that a better number than a square a root real, of two? A real number, no? For example, what? have a real number, a non-rational. Why why these numbers why? should be rational? Uh, I put rational because it's coming from most of the computation are coming from dimension of things. So I was okay. expecting that uh, you are doing question of dimension of things. So they only going to appear uh, natural numbers, okay. <laughs> and then you do the question and you have rational. Okay. But uh, fair enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but maybe if you, if you find something uh, asymptotically to to something not rational, it would be amazing. But uh, but it, maybe. Uh, I know, but for me it would be weird because uh, mu and tau are not. Are, uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, but it is the bound. It is the bound. It is the bound. But uh, the, when you when you are doing the other bounds, usually the only things that appear are dimensions. Yeah. So that that's the point. Okay. And it would be, I mean, it's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So please, thank, if there are no more questions, thank you for this. And now, now it will be the poster session, which...
Yes. Okay. So. Ah, okay. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this uh, parallel session. So the speaker is Jose Edson Sampaio from the University Universidad Federal de Ceará, So his research interests are in similarity theory and how it relates to topology, geometry, and analysis. In particular, interest in Lipschitz geometry of similarities and his main current projects are on invariance of the multiplicity, regularity theory of analytic sets, classification of analytic sets and the reproductive equivalence, and the development of a metric algebraic topology theory. So, okay. Very nice. Thank you very much for a uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Thank you also for the opportunity to be here using this talk. So, uh, I will talk about classification of CMC surfaces uh, in R3 with isolated similarity. CMC here means constant mean curvature. Okay, so the theorem that I'm going to talk about. One, Today is the following. Uh, let X in R3 uh, be a topological manifold. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. In algebra set. Algebra set. Which is uh, topological manifold and assume that uh, the dimension of the singularity of X is less than one, that means maybe it does not have singularity, for example. Okay. So if X minus the singularity of X is a PMC. Surface, then, then single X is empty, and moreover, uh, X is a plane right here. Here around it here, or a cylinder. Okay. So the motivation of, of this uh, theorem that comes from the uh, same result of uh, such a there are two such a classification of CMC or minimal surface, etc. are very important in, in cytometry, but there is there are in fact two different results about classification of surface. It gives the same classification as in uh, this was given by Barbosa, but uh, the first uh, uh, the Carmo, Carbosa, the Carmo, the Carmo, and the Ibai, the Carmo, 
Fernando Fernandes. The same asking that X is, uh, for example, X is a free major of a polynomial C, and the gradient of C is X is equal to zero for an X in X. For example, this is a function, this is what, of course, without singularity, because it's more than this is because it's a very major value of the global. And with that assumption, this is true, but even a, it's a less assumption, only a thing uh, is most about singularity, this is the same. If x is algebraic and c and c, then is I here a plane or a thing. Uh, and then, they prove also that uh, there's a, but here in this paper they prove even when X is in algebraic or globalist analytic, uh, if they ask if that of course is closed. But when it's algebraic, it's closed always. So if it's closed, globalist analytic, it has the same result. Here also it has the same result. We only need to ask here globally to analytic and global. And uh, before, in fact, there, there was a result of Barbosa and the Carmo uh, in 2000. In fact, uh, it appeared before and died, but it was published after. That uh, is, it is a algebraic and real life. And then uh, Alexandre Fernandes proposed to me this problem uh, when I was a PhD. Not in my thesis, I did that when I was writing my thesis, but I, I did not put it there. Uh, in fact, it's a now, but some years after. Then, um, um, I think for the problem, I think, um, I think, I, I could finish part of the game in the club, uh, in a red time. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so now, um, I want to do that, of course, if I do this, if I do this, Singular, the singular are in and from this small well, any one of these without uh significant, right? And in order to prove that, as for me in my abstract, uh, I will give a hint how how to, to prove the following theorem. Uh, this is in fact uh following theorem. Um R3 is a topological main code uh, with the uh, 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 If I do it in red, and if I do it in red, means maybe it does not add in red. Okay. If I do it in red, and of course, Outside of this isolation lab, the mean is that you make sense there. So the mean is that you found it. Mm. It's bounded. Mean is that it? Then, X is C1 
alta e isso. em alta e aqui nós temos time start start one e aqui nós temos alta e então deixa eu me deixa eu me apresentar para alguns modelos of what kind of take a similar like a por exemplo take alpha mu which and then one and this is fine like at out of the set of three but that is alpha in x square plus y square and c is written in two. So we have some models like that. Guys are elliptic monomorphs, for example, and by this theorem, uh, this guy, in fact, you can do, you can calculate the near curvature and the easy, for example, the near curvature here is some problem. So we have like a uh, nothing here, we calculate this, uh, this, this calculator, this one is zero and this one is none of but this is a little bit monomorphic guys for example this has rounded in equilibrium and this does not have so for example loudness of in equilibrium is not a elliptic invariant and then a second example uh let me let me show, for example, you cannot set C2. Here is C2, right? But I mean, C2. Because you have a very special, these are very special examples, right? But if you, for example, uh, write the function from R2 to R, to be F x y, to be x square plus y square, times x. This is a, a C11 function which is not C2 at the origin. And then we take the graph of this. X is the graph of, of F. So it is a C11, but not C2. Okay. So it cannot affect C2. But if you assume here, uh, the found that if the near curvature is like the elliptic, then we we have to find to find that this the the, the, the surface X is even if we assume that the the, the near the near curvature is zero, that somehow there there zero in the end, we can do it, and. The way to do that is, for example, when you have, uh, right, uh, if you start with what, what's that, right? So let me, let me talk about a little bit. No, I, I don't care. This is only a, uh, uh, here is only an assumption that supports me to. Without any uh, other thing. Yes. And such that we are seeing this is a support. That's good. Okay. So 
but uh, for example, this kind of problem was an um, old problem, but it's an old problem. Uh, the first uh, time this was solved in some things like that was for minimal surface, but when, for example, when I expose the graph, this. Even here, we are not assuming that I see a graph that makes it over. But in the special case, when this is a graph of some function, for example, the final D to R, this is the some disk that is in R2, for example. And then uh, outside of the, the star, we, we, for example, have this, right? This of the uh, the one that was square half zero this is the equation of the minimal, minimal equation, for example, the usual equation. It means the outside of outside of, of the origin, for example. So the first so for example, uh, we can remove this in right. So X is moved at the origin. So when we have that, this was in in a uh, lean so that when you can put now a constant here, like two times eight, then you have a constant mean for the thing, for example, uh, uh, and uh, in ninety one was put by. They are, and what is it? Ninety-one. When eight is eight is constant here, eight is zero, and here eight is one. Up to across the world. And I'm often saying that you can even prove that when A is, I do not say what to that, but a second statement of this theorem is when the nuclear tree is the alpha, for example. Outside of, of the thing like so it's the mean curvature in the real world. That's why uh, here, here I'm saying uh, uh, because I did not say, but uh, the mean curvature means uh, I'm calculating the the mean curvature in the real world. But yes, 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 yes. That's the uh, you know I don't have any notes here, but I'm looking at this. Uh, 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 let me give some hints of how to do that. Because now, let me put a second question, a second student. Uh, moreover, now, moreover, the need to let it be also. The alpha, then X is this is this So, uh, for example, there is a result of Gulliver. In 1976, it's good, for example, in, with that assumption, locally around the singularity, you can uh, find uh, isothermic coordinates. Like, uh, let me assume uh, the problem is local, so I mean, I assume that uh, uh, X is anomorphic at this particular. You can find some homomorphism from. This way, 
think we are in the outside of the of the origin these are like new parameters. Okay. So but by Gulliver we can we can uh, by by doing some uh, uh rotation, for example, we can assume we can in fine X, uh, maybe, yeah, five is that, okay. of X, Y, is, uh, let me, let me put in coordinate, in complex coordinate here, this is something like, uh, uh, omega power N plus O of omega N, something like that. And if we reset, it is uh, easy now. Uh, this is uh, I, I have to join a lot of a lot of results of Julia to, uh, to arrive in this form. But after we have arrived in this form, we can see, for example, I did not define what means transient point because I defined it last week uh, in day two. But we can find, for example, we have only one uh, tangent limit plane, and uh, we have only one uh, tangent plane as a limit. That means when you have as a, a segment of point, let me assume, for example, the, the, the singular to zero, and you try to do that, and it's like Conversion to T, there is only one T of that. And moreover, we can, we can calculate it contains the, the tangent one of X of zero. So, in the second step, arrive, after we arrive that, we consider, for example, let me assume uh, the T is just the uh, here, 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 here. After, after, here. Okay. And then we take a projection from uh, X to T, and we can find some some open set A around of the origin, but that this is open. It's an open map. Right, uh, very technical. That, but we can see this is an open map. Okay. And after that, we can define, we can define uh, a function, maybe by shrinking A a little bit in order to define F from, let me ask for example, can this is open, you can, can take a ball inside of A, and zero. For example, so you can assume A is an open, a open ball, and you can work now in the open ball which reaches half of that open ball. And then you have a, a function from the two to R defined by this We take uh, to the maximum of of the coordinate P such that X is in the last coordinate P. And because this is an open map, we are also a uh, uh, of course, now the graph of the graph of F now is continuous in net. And now we, we can do, for example, F is continuous. And because F is continuous, this is a topology manifold like that. But if this is a topology manifold, they are equal in a neighborhood of the origin. So X is a uh, a, a graph of a continuous function outside of the origin. 
uh, around the Orange, sorry. And then, but, uh, the, the, the domain of, of X is containing this, this. So, you can use, for example, in this function theorem, to prove that X, this X is removed outside of the origin, as it is moved here. So, uh, of course, F is smooth, so we can, uh, we can uh, play with, uh, for example, uh, now, now if you have more, because X is, X is like, uh, so for us to make food, as we call into a X, uh, the tangent one of this point of x is is a plane or something that is containing a plane. Because in the smooth part is a plane. And in the singular part is containing two, which is a plane of well. So you can prove this step when a function has such property because it's that plane are uh, very confusing. You can prove that this can be one. So, in fact, F is T1 of T. Then, uh, X is T1. And since X is T1, now we can put more, for example, T, and I think, for example, F is lift. So, but F satisfies a, a lift, um, TD, uh, here, for some function, which is bounded. Now, here, in, uh, in a little way, I don't know if you know, but in the uh, outside of outside of of uh, of the origin, as far as this condition in the castaway, in the castaway, but this has to lift it now, this is a solution uh, across the origin and in a little way. So, so now we have, since we have a weak solution, a weak solution for a problem, like that, this is, it comes a only form, a leap to the leap, and with that we can have a result, we have a result of the result of the leap, and then this solution is even out of an out. So if, if that is, for example, this is T1 alpha, this for me and alpha. And, uh, this is. So, I have to this first part. For the second part, I confuse because if it's T alpha or, or as the alpha is rebounded around the around the view, so we have, we have already uh, the, the, the surface is one alpha. But uh, with that assumption, we may be thinking this, we have the critical problem of that, that we should now let me read here. That critical problem has solution for a small I know, for example, uh, F of this bound of D equal to F, because it is F is given, right? And it's continuous. Uh, here is uh, C2, for example, C2 alpha. This, so, maybe clicking, clicking D, this problem, when this is the alpha, and this is the two alpha, if I can find a solution, a strong solution of it, in the first way. But we have much more people for that, for that. So the two solutions are weak solutions, but we have only one weak solution. So that weak solution, which is F, is equal to the strong solution, 
Trying to understand the videos, uh, I'm thinking, for example, you take a parameter of surface, uh, so one track singularity of one two, that is just uh, a point, so you can see that if you like a plane, you have that one of the points is singular. So I, I, I don't understand what you, uh, what you mean by the singular surface. In this case, if you have a plane, it's one point of the singular. And the incoming curvature, that's how this is important. Which is the which is the surface? There's one plus. If I'm using the set like square, set comma like square, comma by t plus plus two. Okay, at the origin that is two. Okay, and it's only one point. And maybe you have to find a little bit, but you can make that. Yeah, the point is that this, okay, this is a surface which, uh, when you look at the surface now, the, the image of that, uh, let me, uh, let me call P of X to the right, right? From the P to the P, right? So this is the image of P. Uh, I think this has, this is not P2, right? Yeah, there is. Around the origin, yes, but uh, outside of the origin, okay? Mm -hmm. But the need to what true, if this is not, maybe this can be to one alpha. Maybe it can, it can be to one alpha, like, like here. But if, if the similarity exists, uh, the similarity, uh, if it's one alpha, okay, I don't know. But if it's, if it's only to one or, uh, or less, then that, the, the mean to that is, is, is not wrong. It's not wrong. Yeah, not constant. I, I guess my question is, how do you find the singular? Huh? How do you find the singular? Yeah, the, the point, the singular means, the, the, the singular point, means outside of that point, if I use something. It means means you have, the, if you take parameterizations, the parameterization are in buildings and in legends. For example, if you want. So this place, for example, is not because it's not an image, right? At the but outside of the origin, this guy is it is new because he's an image. Maybe maybe we can find another one. I don't know. But but yeah, it's interesting. But I think this one, this one has only one with the limit tangent, right? But what is the only one? Yeah. I just want to so this plane is pointed to this in this PNC. Ah, yeah, because here now, the PNC is the first part of the view. The PNC is pointed, right? The A is pointed, you know. When you see the PNC, it's pointed. Where is the alpha? And then less than that, right? The next step, we will see if we are right? If you assume that it is bounded, then you get a similar local system. No, it's bounded is not enough. What is not enough? What is it? Right? This is it. 
Um exemplo isso. Um ano exemplo isso. Mas, uh, onde a minha filha tinha a filha? O que aconteceu? Não, não, não. O que eu tive de fazer um livro? Eu acho que 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 eu acho que
Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker of today. It's uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Jorge de Olindo Silva, who is professor at the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina in Blumenau. He was a PhD student here in ICMC under the supervision of Farid Tari, and he's done postdocs in Japan and Valencia. His work uh, in his thesis was mainly of in generic geometry of immersed surfaces in R4. But more recently, he's been working on uh, singular objects, geometry of singular objects. And uh, I guess today we're going to listen about chromorphic scales. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Hello, for introducing me and very nice introduction. So first, I would like to thank the organizer to invite me and go back here in São Carlos. A uh, long time we have passed after long, long time, the pandemic time. So I am mean, really, really happy. And it was like a dream to go back here because meet a friend, enjoy, and of course, talk about that. Important enough. So let's go. Uh, where? <laughs> you joke with me, huh, man? <laughs> Okay, 
My talk is the title is the butterfly umbilical cord on the lower part brain curve. Okay. Uh, this talk is going to work with Harid, and uh, especially we talk uh, about the, on the differential geometry about the holomorph brain curve. So let me explain a little bit our object. To after that, this is my goal to help the talk. So here for us, we consider on the regular holomorph curve uh, locally parameterized like that, and gamma v f z, where z is my complex number in the variable x and y, and f is one holomorph function uh, in the component u, is the real part of the function, in the component b is the imaginary part of the function. So, we identify for this holomorph function, for example, the complex space this side to R2, the complex two space we identify on R4. So because that we can view our complex polymorph curve like on the Riemann surface in R4. So that uh, this Riemann surface is possible uh, parameterizes like that. X, Y, U, and B. Okay? But this regular Riemann surface in R4 is special. Because U and B satisfy the Cushman equation. So, why we study this display? The question is I think uh, in 2018, Farid called me, he told me, George, you said me, um, the head surface in airport. So, I would like to understand a little bit about the geometry of the Olomar spring curve. Because that what do you think we study some geometric things like this surface and to translate this result to our holomorph surface? Okay, so that uh, here is the question about it. I will work the goal of our work. Yeah, so the first question is. Study the affine geometry of the Riemann surface, and of course, if we will obtain some results about the affine geometry of the, the Riemann surface, we'd like to know what the results tell us about our curve. Okay, and we obtain some results here, and uh, would like to extend these results for one algebraic curve. So here we we live like one dictionary. We obtain some results you know, one surface, three one surface here, and we got some 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 things here. And the opposite case, if we have something to disturb, this is something about the dimension. Okay, but uh, after I start talk about this actually about Riemann surface here. I need to recall some results about the genetic surface in R4. Okay? Uh, a fine geometry of the surface in R4 is an approach of the singularity. Uh, we search, we have, for example, one book from Sevilla, from Pari, from Puerto uh, Foster, and who was. And we have one chapter that talk about this topic using the similarity theory. And uh, of course, this is, this is one classic. Uh, so that, for example, a little, I think, is uh, described using the classic way to understand the author of this thing. But here, let's explain a little bit. A little bit. This, let's consider locally one point P. And uh, this surface parameterized for this expression, for example, x and y to one and v two. Here we consider the two jets of the, these two functions u one and u two, given by for this persistence here, the second order guys. And uh, we possibly we look at, for example, these binary forms like uh, one point i three, coordinate l, m and n, and 
and other coordinates A, B, and C. And uh, with possibly with this vector is linear independent, possibly we we uh, define the one invariant. And this is invariant possible, for example, with the four resultant of the two uh, binary forms. And this possibly classify point of the surface like that. One point we call the elliptic point, parabolic point, or hyperbolic point. If only if this invariant is negative equals zero or positive. But if, if you associate this distribution here to a matrix, if this, for example, this vector is linear and dependent, you see our matrix is having rank one. So that this point we call the inflection. Uh, if we, for example, we also use the action, for example, the linear group here, this binary form. If we look at the, the, the orbit of this application, the action, this is uh, given by this one. It's possible you call, for example, the, the point, the hyperbolic point, the distance point, parabolic point. Point, you can edit like some point of the type, and you can edit like some point of the type. Uh, okay, here we have the construction of the genetic surface. For example, on the genetic surface, possible, we have the hyperbolic region and the region. We have one curve formed by a parabolic point, which curve is one whole curve. And we have isolated like some point on this. Okay, uh, for example, here I talk about some results about the, uh, the genetic surface in R4. Solarity approach, for example, have a, I think the, the work about Moshita, a little faster than Lewis. The, to understand the geometry of this the surface, they use the contact with the surface with special superimposed. That is, for example, line is plane, for example, here, the, the work of compound, they consider the, the contact with the surface with the here, they obtain some, some characterization, some curve here. If we look at here the contact with the hyperplane, and this projection, this contact is given by some singularity projection that is for example if you look at exactly the hyperplane is given by for singularity of the height function. For example if the height function has singularity A2, this curve has given by for A2 singularity of this projection. There are that is one curve here tangent to this about sky if you look at the particular, the particular uh, points of the our height function which is this point a particular of the height function so anyway it's possible for example we study the contact with line for that we characterize the geometry of the this part use the orthogonal projection we obtain so many results here that we parabolic region and if you look at, for example, understand point, the inflection point, we have the, the work of both the simple data, so the big phases. But, for example, the elliptic region, we don't have so many characterizations about the geometry. Okay? Uh, there, there are, uh, that is one, one work, one PhD about the data. To work a little bit, of course, in the approach of the singularity theory about the elliptic region. For we obtain some characterization about this part of the genetic surface, necessary to use the contact with the plane, but the plane has dimension two. Okay? So the, the, the result there is not complete. So, uh, this is one, like one, one sketch of the results of the 
But anyway, let's return. Our goal is to study the geometry of the ribbon curve. So that we need to understand which kind of the point appear in our ribbon surface. So uh, let's consider here our ribbon surface associated to our uh, complex curve. And this guy is parametrized locally like that. And here, if we look at the, the element, the second order here, our map is given by like that. Because our function here satisfies the Cauchy-Kimmel equation. If we calculate the, our invariant, our invariant is totally negative or equal to. But more interesting thing happen here is this invariant is zero. This is mean the second derivative of u and the second derivative of t is equal to zero. This means we are the inflection point of the curve. This means we are the second derivative of f is equal to In the opposite case, if this invariant is negative, we are exactly in the elliptic point. Okay? So, we have the, the first result here. Any point on a Riemann surface is either an elliptic point or one degenerate flexion point of the second time. Okay? But we need to put attention the name is here because flexion point of the curve is one thing. Inflection point of the second type is another thing. This leaves the curve and this is leaves the curve. Okay? Uh, another remark we can put here, for example, if we, we are in one complex line, all the points is inflection point. So because that our surface, if you are in totally not in this different surface, are the complex ones. Okay. So the important thing I presented before for you for, is the, the geometry of the one genetic surface. But in our case, our point is elliptic point or the generated flex point. Because that we need, we would like to know about the geometry, about this region, the elliptic region, but we don't have so many results about that. Because that we need to consider the contact of the surface with the plane's the dimension. Okay? So that's construction. Uh, this kind of the contact. This contact is given by one projection, the parallel projection, and we would like to to project the point of the outer surface uh, along the one plane to another transverse. Here I will construct a little bit this kind of the projection, a little bit technical. So let's try uh, explain this. So let's consider here. Uh, two planes, by one, by two, and two transverse planes in R4. And uh, uh, let's consider one plane in here, the first plane, uh, generated by U and V. We have four parameters here, okay? And it's possible we identify the set of the planes here, by one, with one open neighborhood U of the origin of the R4, okay? Because that we would like to project point R4, uh, consider one plane P, transverse to height. Okay, we, we chose one, one, one plane here, we would like to project this direction in another transverse plane. Okay, because that's for, for each plane, we obtain one family of the projection, and uh, here is the, the space. Of the, the project. If I consider one, one point in R4, if we would like to project to, to plane 2, we have it, this kind of the projection. Okay? Now, uh, we need to restrict our family the projection to the point of the ribbon curve. Okay? And now, we uh, restrict for this guy, but we start with one half term of the curve. So, uh, 
So that I think we fix that one thing that paper will do. Uh, this this project is mostly one map term from R2 to R2. So for, for we obtain uh, some characterization of our surface, we need to look at the singularity of the project. Okay. Here is a little bit easy to do that, is our projection is singular. If the only if the dimension of the tangent state transverse this plane is equal to one or two. But remember, our surface has only two, two kinds of points. We have ellipse point or the generated section point second time. And remember, ellipse point means uh, I'm not one inflection point of the curve. And if they are one inflection point of the curve, I am in one degenerate inflection point of this one. So because that we have two, two cases. If we are one inflection point of the curve, we need to analyze uh, the dimension one, two, plus case. And of course, this B, not one inflection of the curve if we can analyze this together. Let's go. Uh, what are the possibilities and the possible asymptularity of the project? Okay, we chose here the, the group A because group A is finer compared to group B. A here, the, the mother's group. So we have the classification for uh, map terms from R2 to R2 because that we chose here is the table, the classification made by Higer. Here we have thank you for dimension four. This is important to say for dimension four because uh, our our family uh, the parallel projection has four parameters because that the sense of the the contact geometry of the bone cloud, the fundamental is at the similar extent those that appear are those that end uh, the dimension So because that we have in this case here, uh, in the black here is important to say is the, the dimension of the ground. Okay, because that is the fundamental. Okay, the first theorem is uh, suppose P one point in our Riemann surface, one ordinary flexion point of the this is me. We are in the generated flexion point of the surface. In that case, if we are in dimension one for this intersection, the singular set of the, our projection has for A1 minus singular. And the jet free is equivalent at this the singular. This case here is X case, and another case is rather like that. But if I consider he one generic curve beginning of our work, I consider it generic. Uh, the singularities can appear uh, are those that has the pupil dimension four, but the the three jet is equivalent to at least yeah. For example, happen at this here, only peaks and the uh, goose. At 11, 5, 11, 11, 9, 11, 7, 12, 13, and 16. Okay, this is the largest of one. And now, if I look at for the dimension two, that is our projection is prone to solaris, has one classification by Higgin and Ruiz, and our projection is. Uh, say equivalent to this, this, this term, but this case is not the final determined. So uh, let's look at another case. Uh, if now the point is not one inflection point of the curve, this is this, this is mean we are in the elliptic case. So the first case is dimension one. The singular set here is one regular set. And the jet of the projection 
is equivalent to one fold for x and y x. Y and y x y. Uh, if I consider the generic curve, uh, all the singularities in this family uh, of Euclidean dimension four can occur in our project. Okay, if you look at the get there, possible, for example, fold, cut, follow tail, butterfly, uh, type 7, type 8, type 9, type 9. The possible type. Okay. Yeah, the, the, curve is the curve is complex. The, the surface is not generic. The curve, yes. We consider like that. Generic for us, we consider the, the surface of the paper that this generic curve. Okay? This is generic for us. Okay? Yes. Uh, your question is very nice because uh, we not expect if this surface is generic. And then the, the another case here, which I mentioned is two. Uh, uh, the map term is k equivalent at this case, but this case is not the case. But uh, we would like to, to see more carefully about this attribute. For one generic C, all the singularities in that case uh, can occur in our project. So, let me look more carefully about this case. Uh, in that case, we uh, look again for, for this, this theorem. Uh, it's possible we parameterize the set of the planes uh, where our projection is fitting. Okay, in that case, we parameter we parameterize by three parameters: alpha, lambda, and nu. And we have it like that. Uh, outside the one surface inside this space, this particular space, our projection gives us only four. But inside the one special surface in space, our projection gives you only two. Outside of the one curve. But in that curve, outside of the two points, our projection gives you only follow the singular. But exactly in two points. Here in this space, we have butterfly or word bullet. Yes, this is very or so no more here the, the name here butterfly or word. But what this means means that if there, there are two points, it determines two planes, such that our projection is butterfly or word. But more interesting things happen here. For we determine these planes, the, for example, here, we, this plane is determined by two directions in the tangent space. So, look at, we have two directions in tangent space to determine two planes such that our project is what what is like. So, we were right. Our theorem is there are two planes, phi one prime, phi two prime, which are det determined by two directions, the tangent space, where our singularity in this in this plane is butterfly or word singular. But the very nice thing is this tangent direction, yes, direction, is given by phi so phi one and everything. This is very nice to us uh, because, the, for example, if A is equal to zero, if B is equal to zero, we are in the singular point of the binary differential equation. And uh, A equals zero and B equals zero also is one uh, give to us the project one butterfly. But when A is equal to zero and B is equal to at the same time, we are isolated point uh, in our space. So because that we call this point this butterfly. Butterfly because our projection is the only butterfly or worth 
the umbilical because the umbilical is a classic, the classic name about the singular point of the one binary differential equation. Okay? Uh, so, this is very interesting, yeah? Because we have an isolated point here, we would like to understand it's possible to foliate this surface using uh, the binary differential equation. So, another thing important here is, for example, we are in not inflection points of the curve. Uh, it's very nice now because our binary differential equation can be extended to inflection points of the curve. So, because that, we obtain the following result. The singular point of the extended binary differential equation that determine the butterfly direction are inflection points of the curve and the butterfly umbilical point. The butterfly umbilical point is given by for the equation. Okay? This is very nice because we determine something in our curve that means butterfly umbilical point of the curve. Like that. Okay? The proof of this theorem is easy because when you put a equals zero and b equals zero, uh, the coefficient of coefficient here depends of depends on the coefficient of the t and q that for and only that is determined. Okay, now another uh, natural is the solution of the binary differential equation here. Formula one pair, the transverse foliation in our surface, of course, away the our singular point, that is the butterfly umbilical point, the inflection on the surface. Um, in singular point, we have, for example, the butterfly umbilical point, the curve of the genetic curve. Our BDE is topologically equivalent at this normal form. This normal form we have the, the result about the entirety. And uh, it's possible to look at the behavior of the singular point uh, around the, the, the singular point. And we have the foliation. We have, sorry, we have the classical theory about the differential equation. Singular points, we have monster, star, or lemon. But that case happens from the star. And another case in one ordinary fraction points of the curve, our binary differential equation can be right as a product of the two ordinary differential equations. One of them is one node, another one form. And the foliation is like that. Okay? This is the, the results we obtain in our surface. But the, the question is natural is we have this special point on the surface, but Maybe if we extend this result for one algebraic curve in the degree d in projectivity. But now we need to give a meaning about this question. Okay? So let's consider, for example, the regular algebraic curve projective complex trace, the degree of degree d, given by like that. We have a homogeneous coordinate here. So the question natural is. How many butterfly umbilic points does it have? Uh, okay. The problem is our direction is determined by an average differential equation with real line, with real tangent in case of this. So, of course, uh, we give a, a meaning now about the double equation. How? Let's go. Let's consider our algebraic curve. Let's consider the affine view of this curve. Affine view means one curve in situ obtained by dehomogenizing one equation of C with respect to some line at C. Of course, we can suppose that our curve is a irreducible curve, and we suppose, of course, that the line at infinity intersects the curve in exactly the distance. What will you suppose that the theorem? What will you suppose like that? So, 
Now, after we look at the affinity of the curve, we associate the Riemann surface for this view, uh, affinity view of the curve. Okay, now also the obtains of what the is the And here for for only for calculation, also obtain the optic coordinates is supposed to consider our line at given by W schools. Uh, so we obtain now our lemma is like that. The butterfly umbilical points in our surface are the intersection point with the curve C, with one algebraic curve of the to be A to be minus 12, away from the line at the Okay, and this is the algebraic curve that appears in our or we detect what it's like. The idea is like that. Uh, for example, we have our algebraic curve, uh, regular algebraic curve, because this is regular. One of the, the partial derivatives is the degree of zero. We consider, for example, here uh, the derivative in relation, uh, the relation, the variable B of zero, so because that by this this function theorem, it's possible to write C of function of the U and W, and it tends to be true here. So zero, and we have funny view, we have W is equal one, After that, we have the condition which was the butterfly umbilical point. Remember that condition is three f prime prime f prime 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 minus five and prime 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 prime. Because that only we use this derivative here, we obtain in fact this. Okay, and now we are we are presently our main result. If I consider one regular algebraic curve of the degree b greater than two, let's consider our Riemann surface obtained from one generic affinity of c. If we have isolated butterfly umbilical point contact with this in our surface. The number of these butterfly umbilical point is 8b times b minus. Okay, let's present the step of the proof to understand a little bit. Is for example consider here our our curve and u p associated this. This curve. Remember, UP is this big, this big algebraic curve. Okay? And uh, let's look at the affine view of the curve. And consider the affine view here is the computer W is equal to 1. So the line at C is W is equal to 2. Our intersection, the curve C, with the line at Point. So it's possible to write our curve to be uh, this way. Okay? All the components here have the reading, but here we don't have, for example, the, the variable w. After that, remember up is of the degree a to be minus 12. So remember, use the Zoo theorem. C intersects the curve UP in C times eight B minus twelve. But remember that butterfly umbilic point doesn't happen in, in at infinity because the lemma. So I need to remove it. This 
intersects the point of the infinity, because what defines this point does some habitat. So let's look at this part now. For example, uh, UP at infinity, the line at infinity, is equal UPD UV. See, we show that the UP, this, this guy here, has PD squared as one factor. So, uh, this guy vanished at the root of the So, because that, we need to look at for the intersection multiplicity of this root, because this is important to remove of the our intersection. Uh, let's consider this root simple. Okay, it's possible to do that. And we prove it the intersection of the, our algebraic curve, big algebraic curve, we see this point. So because that we need to eliminate it and remove it from minus 4D point the hour So in beginner we have P times A to minus 12. Now I eliminate it minus 4D and we obtain A to B times B minus uh, but the five But of course now the intersection of the the intersection multiplicity of the butterfly inverse point, we need to prove it is one. Okay. Uh, the idea here is a little bit big, is a little bit technical, but we use the five depth of the, the, the curve. And it's possible we we do it the the section. But for interest here, please apply this expression. Uh, let's consider line is at infinite. Uh, line is complex for infinite space. Give to us uh, one surface is totally butterfly in surface. That case we can use it our formula. Uh, in regular conic, we consider, for example, this point here u v minus w squared equals zero. If you look at the affine view, for example, the u equal one, we get what curve is C2, parameterized by v equal w squared. But in that case, again, the surface is totally by u the surface. I can't use the other formula. That's not an isolated point. So, but if I consider the affine chart w is equal one, to show that this, this surface has no butterfly with point. The number is zero. But if you use these two directions in our formula, V equal two, directly we obtain the U equal two. But let's go to another case more, a very nice case, is the cubic case. Here, let's consider this the cubic. Discriminant here is not zero. And uh, in that case, remember, we have the, that big algebraic curve. The, the degree, the, the degree is a to b minus 12. So eight times three minus 12 is 12. So, uh, p and u intersect at both third six points. Okay. But remember, we need to eliminate the, the lines at that guy don't contribute to what the fine will point. So let's consider the resultant of the two bus curves. And we have the product of the two uh, polynomials. The first polynomial has degree 24, and the second polynomial has uh, degree 12. But here we have the degree 3 and the multiplicity the 4. So if this guy is equal to zero, happen exactly at the point. So we have the this before because that we have we need to eliminate 12 points the hour intersection. So and of course the, the root here happen here are simple and uh, we obtain uh, therefore the number of the butterfly with this point is but if I substitute directly our formula to be substitute C 
be we go to the counter formula, we will be taking our right. Okay? Question. What is a butterfly umbilical point in algebraic theory from its period? We don't know. We ask for for, for specialists in this area, but we can't. Okay? Uh, now, before finishing my, my talk, I would like to say something about my act, but right now here. Maybe <laughs> if, if it's possible to be watching YouTube. So, this is my picture when I was in Fukuoka two years ago. I like this recept so good with Pelia and show the very nice place in Japan here in Kushima, around the beach. There was temple rise on Sejoji. Here, here is the best land of Japan. So, I need to say, Oto Jobi, you get it all the line up to say, and put the character on this. And, this is all. Talk, question. Uh, could you go back to that slide in which you define what you called binary differential equation, please? No, the one with the figure, with the foliation. Yeah. Maybe this is a naive question to you, but for me, it's kind of because I don't understand if this is a, a tensor or a differential form. And how you generate this the foliation? Yes, yeah, this is about Are the demo phase, and we have one, for example, criteria from Paris and Root to detect which kind of the, the binary differential equation has similar point. That phase is proportional to the equation. It has these exactly. But is this a form or a, or a pencil? Is this product? What does this mean? Ah, here. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. The second phase, like the first phase. Why divide to the two? What is this? Here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the normal form. For what? Uh, is this is this wedge product, tensor product? Ah, uh, I. Don't. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe my, my question is a little naive. <laughs> uh, uh, why why the way you use to to compute the number of the the, the umbilical at five points, the projectors, you use the uh, we choose, we choose a geometric, a fine view, yeah? Why it does it depend on this, because this view the, of... Because the, the geometry, the compacted geometry does not depend, only the fine Our project does not, does not depend on the fine. What kind of argument you use to, to guarantee that? Yes, here the, the idea to have is the Geometry information on the surface. The result is in the sense of the most out result. And we, we obtain some characterization on the surface due to the contact of one special object, for example, plane, line. Uh, 
we have one theory about that. So I don't know if this is your question to use direct, but we obtain, for example, the formula to obtain the, the guy is, for example, we look at only the coefficient of the guy. Because if you take the 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 space of the jet of the outer surface, for example, I consider here the jet space of here, and that guy the coefficient here determines some coefficient in our surface. And for example, this guy is equal to zero, this guy is equal to zero, determined by coefficient of this guy. And that coefficient means exactly the derivative of the depth. For example, if we are in the jet three, we have, for example, a three as uh, uh, z, z cubed. So a three means the third derivative of the function and it's like this. Yes. So my question is, can you say something more about your last question? In your, because this was my question in my mind, so you yeah. put the slide and... No, the question is that uh, it seems that you are working... Question if you can characterize this point by using some type of contact. Of course, it's not a complex contact. Yeah. But what I know is when you have a complex structure, you have some many folds and something like that. I don't know. It would be nice if you can find something. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 